I'm Jim Barker, president of Clemson University. I'm very pleased to introduce you to a significant event in Clemson University history. The event actually began before Clemson was a university. It was Clemson College back in 1963. At a time when there was widespread racial unrest across America, the people in the video you're about to see demonstrated courage, leadership, and respect for the law of the land. During the planning and preparation for the peaceful and orderly integration of Clemson College, friendships were formed and mutual respect was built across racial barriers. During that one day, January 28, 1963, the eyes of the entire nation were focused on South Carolina and on Clemson College. We salute those whose action made that day a day we look back on with the sense of pride and fulfillment. Thank you for letting us share with you this moment in Clemson history. In the 1960s across America, racial unrest showed its divisive power. In many communities, especially in the South, there were demonstrations, sometimes peaceful, but often violent. Award-winning author Juan Williams reminds us that today most Americans have little understanding of the early days of the civil rights movement. I came to realize that over half the American people now, in fact probably more than half now, were born after 1965. And therefore most people didn't live through the time at the heart of the civil rights movement, what I would call the golden years from 54 to 65. People don't know about the individual sacrifices that people, black and white, had to make to allow that civil rights movement to have some success. This is the story of one of those successes, the orderly and peaceful enrollment of Harvey Gant as the first African-American student at a state-supported, previously all-white, educational institution in South Carolina. In the decade of the 60s, southern states faced court-ordered integration. Political leaders in one state after another railed against the federal government's efforts to enforce what was now the law of the land. In January 1961, violence erupted on the campus of the University of Georgia when the courts ordered that two black students be admitted. The governor of Georgia briefly closed the university until order was restored. In October 1962, James Meredith attempted to enroll at the University of Mississippi at Oxford. Mississippi Governor Ross Barnett blocked Meredith's court-ordered enrollment. Demonstrators supporting the governor's action became violent. Federal troops were called out to stop the violence and restore order. Two people were killed. Many were injured. On January 14, 1963, George Wallace was inaugurated as governor of Alabama. He vowed segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. South Carolina's test was on the way. A case was moving through the court system that would force the enrollment of Charleston native Harvey Gant at Clemson College. A group of leaders in South Carolina determined that there would be no violence here. They were informed that I was in charge, I was the chief law enforcement officer, and we weren't going to have any of that nonsense that they'd had at Oxford, Mississippi, and the other college campuses. That isn't to imply that there was not official resistance to Gantt's enrollment, because there was. The power structure in South Carolina fought Harvey Gantt's application with every legal means possible. At this time, Gantt was studying architecture at Iowa State University. And guys would say, after they had discovered that I was trying to get into Clemson, why do you want to go get yourself in the middle of that kind of uh, mess? And I kept saying, oh, I don't think that's going to happen in South Carolina. Preparation for Gantt's peaceful enrollment began months before the legal battles were completed. Clemson President Bob Edwards called on his friend, business leader, and lobbyist, the late John Calton. Bob had called me early in the game 
they were aware that Gant would attempt to enter Clemson the following January. Um, Bob uh, had brought his board of trustees quietly into the situation. Uh, Charlie Daniel, who played such a big part in so many things in South Carolina, was another very important uh, advisor to, to Dr. Edwards in this uh, situation. Edgar Brown was the mastermind of the political uh, handling. My first involvement came, as I say, and telephone calls from Bob Edwards. Um, I suggested to him that perhaps the, the best way I could help would be to help mobilize the business people of the state. State law required that Clemson College use all legal means to avoid Gantt's enrollment. And so, in the summer of 1962, the state of South Carolina joined Clemson College in a series of court battles to resist the admission application of Harvey Gantt. The court battles began in Anderson County. And the fact that we recognized that we had to go through the judicial process, but we decided we were going to go through it step by step, but we were going to do it on the most positive way possible and accomplish everything that we could with the least confusion. Matthew Perry, now a senior U.S. District Judge for South Carolina, was Harvey Gant's lawyer. Dr. Edwards uh, and I became uh, friends during the process. Now, we were adversaries during the, uh, the early part of this skirmish. He was charged as the top administrator with carrying out the policies of the university at that time, which did not accommodate the entry of Harvey Gant or others like him. Um, but during the process, uh, during the discovery process, and as we interacted with each other, why we obviously took, took measure of each other and um, undoubtedly formed opinions about the bearing, about the abilities, and about the character and professionalism of each other. And we became, we became lifelong friends. I, I consider him today uh, to be a very fine friend. By the fall of 1962, Gant's application was still being considered by the courts. In December of that year, State Senator Edgar Brown, chairman of the Clemson College Board of Trustees, called on President Edwards and John Calton to assist him in responding to a reporter's question about admitting Gant. Uh, just a word sometime in those stormy days could throw things into uh, discord. So we had to be, uh, we thought, uh, very, very careful about it, and we were. But at the same time, uh, uh, neither Dr. Edwards nor Senator Brown wanted to leave any doubt that Clemson was determined to admit Gantt and was determined to do it without violence. That statement, distributed to the media across the state, was the first public notice that Clemson intended to enroll Gantt peacefully. Outgoing Governor Hollings spoke to South Carolina legislators. He warned them that South Carolina was fast running out of courts in its efforts to resist integration. So I got a, se a session, a joint session together, and said, look, we got everything set. Uh, we're a government of laws and not of man, and uh, we're going to do it peacefully and without any disturbance. Finally, the legal battles reached the United States Supreme Court. State newspaper governmental affairs editor Charles Wickenberg followed the issue through the courts. And within an hour, the clerk returned with the papers in his hand, handed them back to uh, Watkins, and the upper left-hand corner of the page was written in ink, denied, and beneath that were the initials E.W., Earl Warren. 
and under that I think it was January 21st, 1963. That was the end of all the legal appeals that could be made. Even though the legal battle was over, peaceful admission of Harvey Gantt at Clemson was by no means a sure thing. We were, we were receiving threats. Uh, there were crosses being burned and there, were, there was hate mail and there were hate telephone calls. Some people were concerned that even at this late date in the process, a few politicians might try to stage a protest. One focus of concern was the Gresset Committee, charged by the state legislature with keeping segregation in South Carolina's public schools. Former South Carolina legislator Marshall Parker was a member of the Gresset Committee. So we had the best in legal talent and uh, did everything that uh, could to uphold the laws of South Carolina and the Constitution. At the same time, knowing that if uh, inevitable, uh, we would not embarrass the state. Clemson historian Dr. Jerry Reel says that although Senator Gresset was an ardent segregationist, he was dedicated to law and order. His statement to the legislature, just days before Gantt's enrollment, called for upholding the law. Marion Gresset, uh, for all the things one thinks about politicians, he was one who took the high road that day. And by taking the high road, he laid the path for peace for Clemson. President Edwards and state government leaders devised a detailed plan that would avoid violence. The Saturday Evening Post called it the most complete and carefully thought out one ever drawn up in the United States to meet the threat of racial violence. The big player in all of that was the chief of the state law enforcement division, Pete Strom. And Strom had uh, good knowledge, intelligence, of what went on in a number of anti-civil rights organizations in this state and took the trouble of sending some of his agents to see potential troublemakers and warn them not to come to the campus and said if they did that they would be presumed to be looking for trouble. There were thorough preparations on Clemson's campus as well. I think the most important act activities that I was involved in on campus uh, were establishing lines of communication with the faculty and staff and students. And as the procedure through the judicial process was uh, being moved stage by stage, step by step, uh, I made it a point to keep everybody uh, that needed to be know what I knew informed. I'm talking now in terms of administration, faculty, and students. Jim Burns was director of photography at Clemson College. One of the things that, that he suggested or ordered that we do was to take pictures of every faculty member, every staff member, and every student to make an ID card out of them. Now that was a tall order. We had 4,300 students at the time, and we had, oh, somewhere around 2,000 employees, and of course a number of faculty members, and we had to photograph each one of them and put it on an ID card uh, to keep any stranger from coming on the campus to cause any potential trouble. Anna Reed worked in the Agricultural Research Laboratory. I know we had, we had to have ID to get on the campus. And every morning, they, they, uh, me and my out there, and they, I still have my card. It was my uh, social security number, and that's where I worked and everything. We had to have that show that in the morning and the afternoon. Bill Hendricks was student body president in 1963. I think it was a credit to the Clemson student body that, uh, that they were thoughtful and, and mature and disciplined enough to realize that we did not want to bring discredit on ourselves. We did not want to look foolish in the, in the eyes of the nation. Uh, we were going to uh, deal with this appropriately, and, and we did. The plan drawn up by Brown, Edwards, and Cawthon called for state political leaders to stay in the background during most of the activities leading up to Gantt's enrollment. Politicians were caught between conscience and vote. And it was a heck of a job for them to try to sort their way through it. Would they do what would reelect them, or would they do and take the high road? And by removing that burden from them, then it was a very successful way to, to 
make sure that this campaign, this struggle, would not be resolved in the streets, but resolved in the courts. Governor Holling's successor was the late Donald B. Russell. In a South Carolina ETV interview, Governor Russell recalls his pledge to President Kennedy about the Gantt enrollment. Mr. President, we in South Carolina don't need troops. We don't need United States Marshals to enforce the law. We in South Carolina are a law-abiding people, and I pledge to you that there will be no trouble at Clemson University. On January 28, 1963, the day of Harvey Gantt's entrance to Clemson, approximately 160 news correspondents were on campus. Clemson House was a hotel then, and uh, we turned the basement over to the Tiger Tavern in the basement to the news media for that period of time. At a bank of telephones in the corridor, and uh, Dr. Edwards and Joe Sherman would hold periodic press conferences. The plan called for Harvey Gant to be driven to the campus by his lawyer, Matthew Perry. I was told that uh, there would be law enforcement observing my, my move. Uh, there was an advance escort uh, way up the road, sufficiently in ahead of us, such that a casual observer would not have known that this was uh, uh, my advance uh, 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 law enforcement. And I was being followed from behind, also from a sufficient distance. Uh, we were being observed from the air. And as we went from county to county, there, was, there were lo local law enforcement uh, contingencies uh, along the, the roadsides. And, uh, uh, in the immediate environment. Um, I was told to drive as fast as I needed to drive in order to plan our arrival at the administration building at 1.30. Matthew Perry and Harvey Gant arrived at Tillman Hall at approximately 1.33 p.m. The news representatives outnumbered the 100 or so students who were observing the scene. The only violence of the day was the shoving and scrambling among the news people as they tried to improve their camera angles of Harvey Gant. The actual enrollment took place in the registrar's office, at that time located in Tillman Hall. After his registration, Gant made his only statement of the day to the media. And I said that I think consistently throughout the, the entire process and I'm just a student, I just want to go to school. There's no, there's, no, there's no NAACP or no civil rights organization that said go. They're obviously happy that I'm doing it. They helped to underwrite some of the costs and the legal expenses associated with it. But when it got right down to the bottom line, um, I was a South Carolinian, a child of the South, lived and raised, born and raised in South Carolina and wanted to go to Clemson. He came across as uh, not someone who was there to prove something or someone who was uh, had a chip on his shoulder by someone who was a student. He was a student coming to Clemson to get a first class education in one of the best architecture schools in the country and and uh, that's the way he came across so I give a lot of credit to him for the way it was for the way things happened. At the news conference at the end of the day a reporter asked Dr. Edwards whether he considered this a great day for Clemson College. Well, I simply stated that as far as I was concerned, uh, we are happy that things have occurred as they have and we will let uh, future generations determine whether this was the greatest day in the life of, of this institution. As Harvey Gant buckled down to the study of architecture, he found fellowship off campus in Clemson's African American community. When he came, uh, he last brought him over to our church. And then he brought him over to the house. Harvey, used to, after that, he used to walk over here. Because he didn't have a car, he didn't have a car and thing. So um, he joined the choir at our church. And uh, he was always a gentleman, you know. And uh, so uh, uh, on Sunday, on the weekend, he'd come over here. I had to have a church home. 
uh, Floyd Gant and, and uh, Lawrence and Andrew Reed and their families all went there and uh, I, I had to go to church on Sundays sure. and that was where I went and uh, we had a great time. Certainly students paid a lot of attention to me. Uh, I wanted to conduct myself in a, in a sensible uh, student-like manner and no one approached me with regard to any, um, any nasty situation. So as the days went on, I'm sure that any sense of fear I might have had continued to recede. Walter Cox was Dean of Students in 1963. Academic colleagues in the School of Architecture, when they met him and saw his ability and his attitude, and his work ethic, he quickly won respect and became a part of that body. He was a Clemson architectural student that you could be proud of. And I realized this was a bright young man that wanted an education and wanted to cooperate on his part, and uh, he did. And we developed a friendship then that continues today. Gant's enrollment at Clemson was accepted calmly in both the black and white communities. You know, I always had a, uh, you know, I had a reputation of never having had a segregated waiting room in my clinic. And uh, so I, I had black and white patients that, and I, I'm kind of close to my patients, and we talk about a lot of things, like politics and race relations and what all is going on in the world, and uh, uh, and we talked about this, and I, I didn't hear any local people really say anything uh, uh, bad about this. Nationwide, Clemson College and the state of South Carolina received much favorable media exposure. Dr. Lewis Suggs, professor of history at Clemson University, evaluates the peaceful and orderly enrollment of Harvey Gant. I think a good deal of credit goes to both Gant and the students and to uh, President R.C. Edwards as well. Uh, uh, President Edwards uh, uh, is going to go down in history as one of the great leaders of this state based upon uh, what he did in 1963. In May 1965, Harvey Gant received a Bachelor's of Architecture degree from Clemson. But clearly that experience, uh, which gave me initially notoriety and perhaps fame later, um, was one I think that has served me well. And I came out of it uh, very positive. It would not have been possible if we hadn't had Harvey Gant, the wonderful person that he is, Judge Perry, the attorney and the wonderful person that he is, the understanding of everybody that was involved in having responsibility, working together with two-way and open communication made it possible. Uh, he is a very interesting and wonderful person. Uh, I, I will always admire his, his uh, courage. Uh, I say courage in, in, in standing tall and saying we're simply not going to let this uh, event a black mark on Clemson's history or South Carolina's history. And I think it was his leadership more than anything because he was on the front line. He was like the general out there with the infantry, so to speak. All the other political leaders were back in Columbia or somewhere else. But he was right there, right in the middle of it. How do you account for the difference between what, a, what, what met James Meredith and what met Harvey Gant? I believe that, that I've taken you through the process uh, and the differences lie in, uh, in the manner in which both states approached it. Um, in Mississippi, you had a, a governor who urged uh, lawlessness and, and, and physical resistance on the part of people. In South Carolina, you had political leadership that, that called upon the people of South Carolina to be lawful and to refrain from violence. And you had a carefully planned and orchestrated uh, move by responsible officials to see to it. Columbia businessman, now Clemson University trustee, Dr. Lewis Lynn, was in high school when Harvey Gant first came to Clemson. He said that when he saw that Gant was accepted, he knew that he too could attend Clemson. I think it sent, sent a message. Harvey's um, peaceful enrollment sent a message 
that um, you know South Carolina didn't do what the world expected, uh, and and the follow-up message was that nothing ever happened. And you know, if you if you look outside of South Carolina, Clemson was integrated one day, and you didn't hear anything else about it. And Clemson became more integrated as as folks like me came two years later, and and to the to the point that um, folks never think of Clemson black and white; they think of Clemson on. In South Carolina, in January 1963, people with strongly held opinions accepted the rule of law. George McMillan, a writer for the Saturday Evening Post, called it integration with dignity. Today, Clemson University proudly salutes Harvey Gantt as the first in a long line of outstanding African-American alumni. We are the history makers. You have tremendous power as individuals to make a difference. A group of individuals on both sides of this issue accepted their responsibilities and made a difference. A long-standing racial barrier was broken, and it was done with respect and with dignity. <laughs>